Hi, uh, my name is uh, Tom De Potter. I'm here at ESC 2015 together, together with Dr. Pierre Lambiase. Uh, Pierre, you have agreed to talk to us on the SICD system. Thank you very much. Yes, and, and I'm really interested in hearing your opinion on the system and, and, and in your opinion on its recent inclusions in the 2015 guidelines. What does it mean for the SICD therapy? Okay. First of all, the SICD has been included in the guidelines as a 2A indication for patients who don't require bradycardia pacing, CRT, or they have sustained monomorphic BT requiring ATP, anti-tachycardia pacing. And you might think that's a relatively niche group of patients to be implanted, but I think it's going to have major implications when considering implantation of ICD for the wide population of ICD candidates. All right, uh, you touched on it already. Uh, mm. if, if you think of an SICD yeah. system, you right. could consider it as a targeted therapy for a niche right. population yeah. or as a product for all comers. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on this? Well, I think initially the, the device was being used in quite niche groups of patients who had limited vascular venous access or, or patients with structural heart disease where there were issues regarding lead placement. But it's becoming increasingly evident now that the device performs extremely well in a wide group of patients and over 40% of the patients we studied in the pooled analysis have standard ischemic cardiomyopathy, so normal candidates for ICD implantation. And the limitations that people have had have been, have been concerns regarding the need for pacing or CRT once the device is implanted, but only about 2 to 6% of patients actually have a pacing indication of a period of about 4 to 6 years after ICD implant. So if one sees a patient suitable for ICD, but I think the question we should be asking now is, do they actually need a transvenous lead? And if they don't, seriously consider a subcutaneous system. All right. Potential criticism, of course, could yeah. be that if you do start targeting, let's yeah. say, the younger population, yeah. potential criticisms could be battery long longevity, yeah. which might be limited, or mm. MRI compatibility, which sure. might be an issue in the yeah. young people. Well, what are your ideas? Yeah. Okay, well, the, the second generation device that Boston Scientific have um, brought forward uh, now has uh, a battery longevity of just over seven years predicted. So that's obviously a significant improvement, improvement over four, four and a half years that the uh, previous um, system had. Right. So I don't think that's going to be an issue. And then with regard to um, MRI compatibility, again, Boston Scientific already have MRI compatible ICDs, and I think that, that we're on a journey here to actually transition that for the, for the newer system. So you mentioned the second generation system mm. already. We're not even there yet, but let's talk about what's on the horizon next. Yeah. How, uh, where do you see the therapy going? Well, essentially, the, the next challenge really is to use leadless pacing. So the patients who may intermittently have a bradycardia indication or ultimately have a require permanent pacing, again, to get a, avoid these problems of the long-term transvenous lead issues, there are now leadless uh, pacing electrodes which are already available from uh, Medtronic, but also Boston Scientific are developing their own leadless system. And that will, uh, certainly within the next five years, I'm sure will be transitioned to be used and with a subcutaneous ICD system. All right, excellent. Thanks a lot for your time and uh, pleasure talking to you. Okay, thank you.